around because it was an authority figure. Um, but also walking around your facility. This is absolutely incredible. Well, thank you. You know, we're fortunate. And uh, uh, as I told you off the air, you know, this is my 20th year. And so uh, there's obviously uh, been a lot of hands in it and uh, from, from the administration. And, of course, uh, those things just don't happen overnight. And, uh, you know, it's, it's been a, a several athletic directors and, uh, and, of course, a fan base, you know, that, uh, you know, is just so passionate about college baseball that buy the tickets that, that enable an administration to do stuff like that. So we've been very fortunate. When you came into the SEC at 33, mm-hmm. You came, obviously, you know, we'll, we'll take a few minutes to talk about your lineage as a player and a coach. I mean, we know that very clearly from LSU and what you learned. But when you came here at 33, that's early. That's young. Yeah. Um, and, and I remember watching your trajectory and knowing that you would have been superb and, and great because of your detail. When you take a job like that, though, there's got to be a moment where you look back and go, oh, my. Like, what am I stepping into? Oh, yeah. I You know, I think uh, – you know, stepping even a, a little bit further back, I was at 30, became the head coach at McNeese State, was there for three years. Uh, but, the you know, going back, you know, now 19 years, I remember going to the first SEC coaches meeting. And uh, I remember sitting at that table in Birmingham and looking at, at that time, there was uh, 12, you know, uh, SEC teams. And so 11 other coaches. But in that room was, you know, Ron Polk, you know, Skip Burtman, uh, Norm DeBryan, Andy Lopez, Ray Tanner, and Jim Wells, uh, Roy Muburn, uh, Keith Madison. And so, you know, as, as I'm sitting in that room, as green as green can be and, uh, you know, excited, but so nervous and, and really in so, so much awe. Uh, and I remember at one point figuring out that I was the youngest coach in the SEC by 15 years I think Wells was at 48 at the time and uh and but you know the other part was you're talking about legends you're talking about Skip Burtman and you know Ron Polk and Andy Lopez and guys that you know won national championships that were when people thought of college baseball they were thinking of those guys yeah did you when you took that job did you when you took this job here at Ole Miss did you sit back and have a vision. I mean, can, you couldn't imagine 20 years later this is what it was going to look like. But what, yeah. we all know – the reason I'm asking is we all remember the Skip story sure. of driving in. You had to have one of those too. And for our listeners, when Skip took the job, he wrote down everything he wanted on a yellow book. And like 120, 120 two, things. Yeah. Triple A lights. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. But did you do the same thing? I, you know, I, I don't know if I wrote it on a legal pad like he did. In a, uh, in a station uh, wagon with in four daughters. In a station wagon <laughs> and a dog you know, driving up from you know uh, Miami Beach to For our to listeners, just so you understand – We've heard this story <laughs> so many times. <laughs> it's well, the first speech of the year every yeah. year, and uh, and the girl you know, from Ames, you, Iowa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You played four years. I, five, I, I five, five years. Yeah. Well, almost. You know, I'm yeah. right there with you. Two, two as a player and five as a coach. So I, I heard it at least seven times. But, uh, uh, but the story that the way you bring it up is a, is about vision. You know that, yeah. that you see something that's you know now and what what's it going to be you know down the road. And I think there was a lot of that. You know, uh, to where. Uh, hey, we we can expand this stadium down the sides. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And and uh, but I think the biggest thing, and as Skip, when when you hear him tell the story, is to get people to to buy into that. Yeah. You know, because usually when there is a coaching change, there's a reason for the coaching change. If it's not because of retirement, uh, you know, a lot of times it's because the program's not having success, and so you don't have the fan base. So you don't have the large stadiums. You you don't have uh, a lot of buy-in from the administration or maybe even the fans and so to me that's the first part you know the first part of building the program is to get that buy-in to get people to trust you because uh, I remember hearing the stories from Skip but they weren't LSU stories they were just stories I think of anybody building a program or business you know getting people to well ah that's not going to happen or oh, somebody's tried that before and um, I remember here where they just didn't think people came to the baseball games until basketball was over you know they would sell a season ticket package uh, for SEC games only I said well then they'll never come to the non-conference we need to sell you know uh, you know for the entire season not just the SEC games I remember they wouldn't open the gates in the outfield because they didn't want to pay a ticket taker or a security guard out there Um, but it was almost like they just assumed people wouldn't come and so there was a lot of that convincing and do you you think in that area because what what you're talking about is so fascinating is getting people to buy in like we're here 
But to go there, it's going to require us to do something different. But the investment seems like a lot, but it's really... It's it's you know it's incremental. It's, it's, it's incremental. over. You know, nobody's asking you to build you a nineteen and a half million dollar building, you know, in year one. That that happens over time, and uh, but you know you, there's there's a buy into the program. There's a buy into the players. I found that to be much easier. I think you know, the student athletes that they, they want to win, and uh, they, you know sometimes the change is good for them. You know it's exciting, and and, and they, they're such they're, their their lifespan is so short that they're used to change. You know a lot mm-hmm. of things have changed in these young people's lives. You know uh, over the last few years, you know the, it's convincing the fans, and I think where a lot of people uh, you know, were in that that lottery uh, based philosophy where you that instant gratification where you want it right now and so uh, but it's it's 10 fans at a time it's 50 fans at a time mm. it's 100 fans at a time you don't just go from you know not basically selling season tickets to averaging 9000 a game that that doesn't that's over time mm. and it's that delayed gratification that you hear about that you know just because I went and spoke at a rotary club you know today and gave an hour of my time doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to lead the the country in attendance next year do you when you look at the growth i, I think about when you showed up at LSU in 1988 mm-hmm. 20 years prior to that was 1968 mm-hmm. you've been at Ole Miss for 20 years yeah. The evolution of that period, I mean, because you, if you look 20 years prior to you, there were wooden bats. Right. You know, wool uniforms, 15 people in the stands. Never thought about it like that. It's a whole different perspective, but you're yeah. right. Yeah, and so if you look back 20 years from when you started. I'm an old guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, people look at you, and, you know, I always see you as young. I see you as a contemporary, right? Mm-hmm. But, you know, in my age group, but when you look back to starting here in 1999, or Two, uh, summer of 2000. So summer 2000, that's right. right. So summer 2000, you come in, and you look around, and you see a stadium. And honestly, from a player standpoint, how many big-name players had come through here? David DeLucci, who's a dear friend of mine. But who else? You got the Kessingers. Kessingers, yeah. Right, yeah, the whole Kessinger family, right? So yeah, Don, so it's coming Don, from one yeah, DNA you're back, right. pool. Exactly. And so we better make sure we, we, we recruit the, the grandson that was right. you know, just a superstar here for the last three years. You know, Jake Gibbs. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, Jamie Price, who was a star in yeah, the Southeastern Jamie. Conference. You know, uh, yeah, we played against yeah. him in the mid-'90s at LSU. And, uh, but not a ton. And, and, and again, um, it, was, it was a program that had a lot of success back in the 50s, the 60s, maybe some of the 70s, but over the last 20 years, uh, I think when I took over, if I remember correctly, they had only been to postseason twice in the last 25 years, and uh, so that's that's not a lot of success. How do you build people to believe that they can win that? Well, I, I think you know one of the things that we did here, and you know you learn from you know the maybe arguably the greatest college baseball coach of all time, uh, in Skip Bertman, is you got to go sell the program. It, where baseball is not like football, at least college baseball. Is not like you know college football and what I mean by that in a lot of different ways but but the obvious reason is just because you win doesn't mean you're going to draw just because you know you have a successful program and you you know you win baseball games you can look around and LSU's done it obviously they've had a lot of wins and they 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 do it in the in the box office as well uh but there's programs that don't draw there's programs that have a ton of success but they're very average as far as attendance and you know there was a formula there was a as coach would call it you know a system of way uh, ways to do it and and one of the things was when I got here you know I you know, back then the internet was uh, just starting and so you could go and you could google the chamber of commerce you know in oxford mississippi and the surrounding areas and you know the rotary clubs the kiwanis clubs the the optimists you know they have these civic organizations that have a meeting once a week and they have to get a speaker they're dying for somebody to come they usually have to go out and find their own if you send them a letter or an email, has an email address, <laughs> they'll say, sure, tell us when you want to come. They'll put you on the docket, and you can go speak. And you go tell them, and, and, and you sell your program. Hey, we got this beautiful stadium over here, college baseball. If you've never been, I remember asking people, raise your hand. There's you know, 50, 60 Rotar- Rotarians. They've never been to a baseball game here. And so you just ask them, and that's the – 
That's the thing that people don't do. Ask. Ask somebody to come to a game. Check us out. You know, it's, it's cheap. It's, it's cheap entertainment. Bring your kids there. And then all of a sudden, once they come, they start to realize it's a, college baseball is a neat event. And it's very affordable, especially compared to football and basketball. And that's how it starts. But what happens, I think, to people is they lose their, their, their energy. You know, it's because I went and I, well, I did all that my first year. There's some clubs that I've been going in Oxford for the last 20 years. And some of those clubs have less than 15 people. I kind of feel bad not going now yeah. because I did when, you know, 19 years ago. What am I, too big that I'm not going to go now? So I continue to go. But it's just selling the programs. It's handing out the, 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 the schedules and the season ticket brochures and asking people to show up. And, again, just like building a camp, building a program, you know, now your, your attendance goes up by 100, then 200, then 500, then 1,000. And over time, you know, uh, the compound effect, you, right? Yeah. Do you do you look back at a time in your career since you've been here and you go, that's the tipping point. That was the moment where the players bought in. That was the moment where the crowd bought in, the culture bought in. You know, and I, I think it happens at different times. I, I think instantly when I got here, um, I didn't think – getting the players to buy in was that difficult. Again, they didn't have a lot of success. They didn't make a regional a year before. Uh, I was fortunate that my resume, and I'm talking about my resume, but I was fortunate yeah. because I, again, coached and played under arguably the greatest college baseball coach, and he's in this conference. And he had just won uh, – he was on, on the verge or that year, my first year, he won his uh, fifth or – the fifth, year that yeah. I got the job, he won his fifth national championship in 10 years. And so, you know, they're the best program in the country. And I coached there. And I was, you know, part of, you know, three national championships. So, you know, I had this nice resume coming in. And I think the kids were hungry. And so the way we coached, the way we implemented our system, it was, to me, somewhat easy to get them to buy in. Now, there were some other struggles with that. You know, we needed to upgrade the talent. We needed to do some different things. But to, uh, from from a coach to a player to get somebody to buy into, hey, we're going to do this offensively or we're going to do this defensively or we're going to do this on the mound. I didn't find that to be that difficult. When did you when did you invest in the mental game? Because you were an early adopter. Yeah, yeah and, and, and to be I honest, say a, adopter. I mean, there were other people, but you were the first that – you were one of the first that kind of stood out there of publicly and – and incorporating in every fab piece of the fabric that you had. Well, you know, one of the the, the and you had a great podcast with Coach Burtman, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a few months ago, and uh, you know he was. Uh, to me, the epitome of a college baseball coach, or epitome of a coach. You know, he had this system uh, that he talks about often, but the system isn't just how to pitch or how to hit. And I'm sure, you know, he, he mentioned that in the podcast. You know, it's not just how you, hold, you know, throw a curveball or how you hold the bat. And that's true. And I think we get so caught up in that, you know, that it's a full service program. It's it's about, you know, kids, you know, you know graduating. It's, a, it's about player development. It's about a lot of different things. It's about community service. And one of the great things about the, what I learned from Coach Burtman about the system is the system system's ever changing. You know, that he would call it the franchise, you know, like McDonald's, the, the quarter pounder in Miami mm -hmm. tastes the same as it does in Los Angeles as it does in Tokyo. And so it doesn't matter where you go. It's that franchise. It's that system. But McDonald's always trying to reinvent themselves. If it's the way they serve the customers with a drive through or, you know, a, a smoothie or a different breakfast item, they're, they're constantly trying to stay ahead of the curve. Well, you got to do that as a coach. So you can have a way that you teach the hitting or the pitching but you also have to stay ahead of the curb and so you know I remember watching Burtman in the 90s with strength and conditioning where you remember our teams at LSU were just more physical than everybody else. Mm -hmm. Everybody called it gorilla ball, and how did you guys hit that home run? Look at our team. Mm -hmm. We were much more physical, you know, uh, when everybody else was trying to do something else. He learned that. And then he also learned the mental game, you know, from Ken Revisa. And uh, I remember Ken Revisa coming to speak to your team mm -hmm. back in, like, 95, 96, mm -hmm. when Coach Burtman was with the Olympic team. And so I got intrigued at that point when he started to talk about the process well before anybody else would ever right. mention that word and you know just your your you know more than just the word confidence it was a way of thinking and that always intrigued me but there wasn't much out there besides Ken Revisa you know at the time and then when I got here we started to have some success and you know 04 we host a regional 05 we're a national seed and then all of a sudden you started to think that there's more to this you know the, this mental game how do we get kids that come in you know as, as high school seniors how can we get them to to be a 
equipped mentally to handle, you know, SEC baseball. And so started reaching out, reached out to you, mm -hmm. reached out to some other guys that are that are in the business. And then, you know, one of the things I think just like anybody else, there's gotta be a buy in from the coaches. Yeah. Big you, time. you can't just, you know, yep. contract a guy in to come, you know, work with your, your your team, you whatever it is, you know, if it's you know, if it's you know the mental game in sports psych or is it's nutrition or strength and condition, whatever it is, you know, there's gotta be buy in from the coaches and not that you gotta be an expert on it. That's why usually you're bringing people in, but you got to be knowledgeable at least as much as the players. Hopefully, you know, maybe you're the middleman, you know, between, you know, whoever you're contracting out and, and, and the players to where you can help, uh, you know, I guess bridge that gap, uh, and and I think that's what we've tried to do. And the different people that we that the coaches, you know, teach the mental game. We're not just asking somebody else to come in. We're asking them, but we're also learning as we go, and we're asking questions. But it's so big. I, I don't think now in 2019, you know, you're going to talk to you know high school kids, a 15, 16 year old kid, and if you say mental game, he's going to know. Yeah. You know, but when I got here, you say mental game. They they thought you were sick. Yeah. You know, like is there something wrong with you? Why? Why? What's mentally wrong with you? Know, what? But but now people understand that that's like speed. That's that's you know that's like you know throwing a breaking ball. That's like catching a ground ball. That that you got to be equipped in, in 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 the mental game. It's funny when I was on internship in Rhode Island in '02, I called Skip and I said, "You guys need to put somebody on staff full time." He was the AD at the time, yeah. and he was like, "Oh, I can't I can't afford that salary." And then I talk to you six, seven years later, and you're like, hey, we really need to put somebody on full-time. And now you look in the SEC, you look at other schools, there's five, six people yeah. in, in the athletic departments. When you look at your coaching um, and your development and your process, and, and I hear a lot of coaches say, God, you know, this, this generation of kid is tough. Mm -hmm. You've gone through 20 years of them. I yeah. mean, the kids that you started with um, 20 years ago are now, I mean, they're four, in their 40s. Yeah. They they have kids we're recruiting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's got to so, be awkward. Yeah, and a little unique. But how do you, how have you evolved? What do you do to stay up on this changing environment? And I think we all, you know, hopefully, if you're going to stay around in this game, you're conscious of that. And so, you know, I think it's tough for all of us. And and again, back to you know something similar that I was saying that you have this system, a way that you do things, but you're constantly evolving. And uh, yeah, the kids are different these days. You know, and we were different than than our parents. Yeah. And you know, and you know, you can be the grouchy old guy you know that just says hey they they need to do this you know my way those guys don't last you know you know uh, very long you got to figure out you know how to reach these kids and so uh through video through you know technology analytics they're hearing more you watch espn and baseball tonight and they're talking about launch angle and spin rate and and you can sit there and go, ah, oh, that doesn't matter. We're we're gonna we're gonna open the the yellow book up, mm -hmm. right? We're gonna talk about you know an extra breaking ball. That still works today, but there's got to be something you know that that helps you know augment that, and something that helps you know the players learn. And uh, you know, so there's different technologies, Rapsodo and Hit Tracks, and these Div Track Man, and and so to be able to communicate with the kids, they're used to learning on a screen. You know, half half of our kids, half their classes are you know online classes, mm. and so they're used to learning that way. It used to be that they learned in a classroom. Now they learn in a classroom, but they also learn on a computer screen. Mm. And so, you know, part of that coaching is learning that. And to, to, to you know, I think, you know, raise your nose to that and act like that's not true or that's not the way to coach. No, they're, they're all doing it. Well, look at the successful programs, the Cubs and the Astros and the people most, you know, successful. They're looking at the analytics. And it's not just OPS. You know, it's not everybody gets caught up in, you know, a few statistics. But it's, it's the way the game's played where, you know, we're saying the same thing, but we're we were just talking, you know, off the air of how the curveball set. Instead of showing yeah. a kid, hey, telling a kid in the bullpen, hey, you got to get on top of that curveball, right? Now you can actually show him the spin access, right, and show him on a on an iPad. And sometimes, it, or a lot of times, with today's day, kids, they're gonna you know, relate to that much easier than they're gonna relate to some pitching coach tell them to get on top of the breaking ball so I think you know everybody's a little different but I think you just got to keep up with technology you got to understand that mentally they're built a little differently yeah you make mistakes I, I remember that you know we would I would come in I was the young hard-nosed coach and you you would think that that's you we can get them to respond it's my way or the highway we'll get them and uh, that was all right 20 years ago yeah now now uh, now, it, now it does it'll work for some kids but it won't work for uh, the majority of kids. And I think that's where you have to understand. And it, it's about relationships. And it's, it's, it's not about – when people say that, I think 
guys that have been in it as long as I do, they think, well, the relationships, I don't want to be their buddy. Well, nobody's asking you to be their buddy. Nobody's asking you to be their friend. That's There's still that coach-player dynamic. Uh, but, you know, sometimes to say it in front of the team, to call them out, to, to bring up things that I think are uh, – that, you know, might embarrass them. Where it might not embarrass the guy 20 years ago, but a guy nowadays – you know, he may be embarrassed or he may be offended, felt that you were calling him out. I think you got to be – there's a certain way that you, you can't do those things these days. So a lot more one-on-ones. And what you find out is those one-on-ones, even though you may be talking about a negative something, a kid got in trouble, you know, in a classroom, or uh, he's not doing a job on the field, he may appreciate that conversation a lot more that you spent the time with him. You know, we all say, well, don't you know I love you and I care? Well, how are you showing that? But if you bring them into your office and you sit one-on-one and say, hey, you can't do this, what, if it's in the classroom or if it's on the field, and explain to them what I need to do, a lot of that times they'll respond so much better to that than the old, hey, you know, you call them out in, you know, in, in a team meeting. And, and I think those one-on-ones, those relationships, you know, um, you start stacking them up one at a time, and, uh, you know, you got a lot better shot with, you know, this generation. Do you do you see, I mean, travel ball showcases high school ball mm-hmm. changing? Without a doubt. How have you evolved your recruiting and the type of kid you recruit? Because I guess one of the concerns about travel ball is it's a lot of showcase, but there's not a lot of grit. Yeah, that, that's yeah. one of the, the theories. Yeah. Right. And, and, and I think that, that there's – and that's fair. I think it's fair, and I also think the age of which you recruit the kids, where uh, you you don't see as long a, a track record, and so where you know the sense to you know make the move. When I say make the move, to, to be able to you know extend an offer, you know, of a scholarship, maybe you didn't see him as long, as, yeah. and you don't have the relationship. I mean, with you're the recruiting kid him earlier. Yeah, without yeah. a doubt. If if you were to ask me your original question, and you're 20 years here, what's been the biggest change in a positive way to college baseball? And I'd probably be in a, a really small minority answering it this way. I'd say travel baseball. Hmm. And, you know, because people always look at it as a negative. But let's face it, you know, we're all going to Atlanta. We're all going to Orlando or Fort Myers or wherever the tournaments are and seeing so many more kids than we used to. Those young kids that we're recruiting, the reason we know who they are is because of the travel baseball coaches called my recruiting coordinator have called me and said, Hey, you need, so they're doing some of the recruiting for us. And so that's all worked in a positive way to me for college baseball and student athletes, you know? And so, um, that's why there's there's a lot less misses now yeah. where you go, how did that kid get to that junior college? How come he didn't get an offer from a bunch of schools in the SEC, you know, out of high school? Well, because, you know, he played basketball, football, and, you know, he, he – you know, went to you know, American Legion. Nobody saw him. He was from a small town. Now it doesn't matter if you're from you know Iowa or you're from Orlando, Florida. You know, there's not a lot of secrets out there well, any day. One of my theories I have is that you high school baseball is probably I hate to say it. I think it's on the endangered list, and and because of the quality of travel ball coaches in general has increased. Former a lot of former players, a lot of players that have played who can specialize and are not having to teach a history class, have get kids after they can pull a group together. And so I, I've kind of got a theory going that in the next five to 10 years, you're going to see a very large uh, um, number of people moving away from the high school game. And I see it in other sports. And I still think there's playing for team pride is great. But when you say moving away, what do you mean? Moving into a travel ball organization where, well, you know, and, and there's, there's, that's happening right now. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know if, if baseball, the sport's big enough. You know, maybe the, you know, you talk the about the elites. Yeah, the elites that are going to train. And, and, and that's a shame, you know, because, you know, to me, at the end of the day, you know, just like the, you know, the, the commercial goes, you know, these guys are going to be pros in something besides baseball or football mm-hmm. or whatever the sport is. They're going to be engineers, accountants, sports psychologists. Mm-hmm. You know, they're going to be different things. You know, I know as a parent and as a player, it's great to have those dreams and aspirations. But at the end of the day, the odds are what the odds are. They're 
they're not having there's not going to be 75 major league teams in the next 25 right. years there's only so many teams there's only so many spots uh and again that doesn't mean that you can't have that goal or aspiration so that's that's sad and i think that's part of the negative of the travel ball you know one of the negatives and so when when i look at it you know the thing that scares me is you know that that it's become this high priced sport where it didn't used to be that way you could play 20 you pay 20 dollars and be part of a little league well there are no little leagues anymore yeah. you know uh I, I look up and you look at the little league world series where where where, where do these kids play from you know the why you know because all the kids that i see are playing you know 10u 11u 12u all this and these kids are probably on some of those teams but go to the little league world right. series and, and some of the other things um I don't have all the answers, but that's you know that's one of the things that that I fear is how many players are we going to lose because they didn't have the means to play on these teams, these thousands of dollars each year um, to to be able to play on you know the right travel team, so they went and played football or they went and played basketball. So let, let me um, I want to change the topic here for a minute. I want to go back to your playing days, mm-hmm. um, way back when. I'm sure when the kids here see it, they're like, wow. It was color TV back then, yeah. but you coached or you caught on a pitching staff that was probably one of the best ever mm-hmm. in college baseball. Yeah. Now you ben McDonald, Russ Springer, Curtis Laskanik, John O'Donohue, Paul Bird, Chad Oje, Mark LaRosa, mm-hmm. who never made it, but yeah, was really good. And probably I think mi- we had eight big leaguers on that team. Uh, I think six that you just mentioned, along with Keith Osick yeah, and Keith Lyle Ozick. Mouton. Yeah. And uh, so, it, you know, at the time, we just thought we were a really good college baseball team. I, I don't know if we realized that we had, you know, probably uh, a third of our, our roster, you know, were future big leaguers. But uh, and most of them being pitchers and, of course, Coach Bertman with the, with the pitching background. Uh, you know, just – uh, again, you know, we knew we were good. We knew Ben McDonald was good. You know, Ben Ben was different. You know, Ben was different than, you know, even the great Russell Springers and Curtis Laskanics and Paul Birds and guys that were really good, you know, I thought, you know, college players ended up being great major leaguers. Um, you know, Ben, you know, was going to be the number one pick in the draft. And so he pitched on the Olympic team in 1988. And back even in November of his junior year, everybody knew he would be the number one pick. I don't remember a time uh, in any draft, uh, you know, especially a baseball draft, where six months before the draft, they knew Ben McDonald was going to be the first pick in the draft. Like everybody, he was, he was in Sports Illustrated. I mean, as a college, how many college baseball players since 1989 have been, you know, an article done on a, on a baseball player, an article, not a picture, not a caption, but an article done on a college baseball player, not football, a college baseball player. I mean, he was going to be the first pick in the draft and everybody knew it. And uh, so it was kind of a different time to be able to catch and you got 40 scouts behind you and you got 15 GMs and, you know, scouting directors and it was different. How did they keep, how did y'all keep the focus there? Well, I thought, again, a little different than now. You know, you didn't have all the agents and you didn't have, I think, the hoopla that you have, you know, now because of social media and because of the Internet and those types of things. I mean, we were aware of it, but I don't know if if you played at Florida or if you played at Georgia, you know, you knew they – Ben McDonald was real good. You know, we had a good pitching staff, but I don't know if you were, you know, that enamored. There just wasn't as much media coverage. It wasn't D1 baseball. and Baseball America was there, but they didn't have the, the college. And you a know, column. You know, you know, had like, you know, one page in right. their, their, their magazine. And so it was just, it was just different at the time. And, and I think, you know, one of the things that we don't talk about much is how Ben handled it. I mean, Ben, you know, what, what, what immense pressure that must have been. And, uh, and he handled it so so well and was a regular teammate and joke and wrestled and now I look back and I go god he was man to be the number one pick and to sit there and wrestle in your hotel room and do some of the things that he did he was just a regular guy and uh and I think that's the way he handled it I think enabled us you know or allowed us to 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 handle and treat him just like a regular teammate yeah for our listeners I mean on that campus at the time you had Chris Jackson yeah Shaquille O'Neal was coming in Mm -hmm. Stanley Roberts Ben McDonald I mean Kevin Mawai, who's now a yeah. Pro Football Hall of Famer. Yeah, Tommy Hodson. Tommy Hodson and yeah. um, Odell Beckham, who's Odell's dad. Right. You know, it's um, it was a pretty fascinating time. Yeah, it was a really good time. How did you end up at LSU? Well, I was, uh, I, you know, I, I I grew up in South Florida, a city called Seminole, suburb of St. Petersburg, and you know, I I my uh, 
my parents were from you know Delaware, and so I had really no ties to any school, and I wanted to play college baseball. And uh, when I out of high school, I really didn't get recruited by anybody that really interests me. And so I went to junior college. I played two years at Indian River Community College, and uh, back then I started getting recruited, um, you know, by Florida State and Miami. And I thought I was going to end up going to one of those, uh, the one of those schools, uh, but. Both of them, you know, seemed like I had visits lined up, and then all of a sudden this can happen, you know, recruiting changes, and, you know, uh, the, the phone calls stopped, and they decided to go after freshman catchers versus a junior college catcher. Matter of fact, the guy that you know, Florida State ended up getting was Eduardo Perez. Yeah, pretty good one. Yeah, yeah he's a pretty good one. Pretty good choice. Now, if I had to guess, probably good Miami choice. was Charles Johnson or something uh, around that one. I don't know. It might have been. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but it, yeah, good good choice. Yeah, pretty good choices. Much, much better choice. But Skip Bertman, uh, unfortunately, got the – the bad pick, and he got got me. So, no, I know. think he got exactly what he wanted in a system guy. Well, I no, no, no. It. But I mean, that's what Skip was brilliant about, mm -hmm. right? Well, you know, I, I think I fit the you know fit the the, the mold you know as as far as in his system and um, you know uh, all the pitching stuff that that we taught and all the the the, the yellow book stuff and uh, you know I just. Um, you know, I was fortunate, you know, I was, you know, back then it was, it was different. I remember going there on a visit and, you know, meeting him and just being enamored by just the, the baseball, him and Smoke Laval and Beetle Bailey, and just listen, you know, I've never been coached like that. And uh, I remember coming home for Thanksgiving, my first fall, and I'd sit there for hours and just tell my father, who's, you know, baseball junkie. I remember just sitting there, you know, telling him about first and third offenses and defenses and pickoff plays. And, and, uh, you know, I was taught baseball in, in such, a different way that I've ever been taught before in a system, in a way of learning it. And it's amazing. As you know, coach would say, you're going to get a PhD, Harvard education in baseball. And he was right. And, um, uh, and, uh, and what was, what was great about it is you retained it the way they taught it because they didn't just teach something, you know, how to do it. They taught the why. That's yep. where most people blow it in all teaching. You know, you know, a lot of people know the how, uh, but teaching the why is difficult. To teach, you know, 15, 20 pitchers, you know, you know why it's an extra curveball and why we do this and why we do that and have them to be able to repeat it to you and then all of a sudden they retain it to become a coach, it was easy because I had learned all of that as a catcher. You learn all the pitching stuff because you're in all the pitching catching meetings, but you're also a position player. And as a catcher, all the bunt defenses, all the pickoffs, all of that's run through me. So I knew what the third baseman did and the second baseman. So to go out and, you know, when I started with Northwestern State, a graduate assistant with Jim Wells, and he said, hey, put the bunt defense. That was easy for me. You know, we go, you know, we're going to do pickoffs today. You remember how? You, yeah, that was that was easy. And so, um, so you know, what a fortunate time that, you know, out of Indian River, go to LSU and just really the start of, I think, you know, uh, you know, Coach Bertman's greatness. You know, they had been to the World Series 86, 87, 88. You know, we didn't go, but then 89, uh, uh, we went in College Station and get back to Omaha for a streak where I think they went like, you know, four years in a row, five years in a row with a couple national championships. That 89 victory mm -hmm. in Texas A&M, they were the greatest college team to ever play. Yeah. And you guys go in and have to win two games yeah. to defeat them. We were real good on one day. Real good on one day. Uh, yeah. You know, it was, a, it was an odd year because it wasn't like we, we were an underdog, obviously. They were 55-5 and five at the end of the year, and, you know, they were ranked number one basically the whole year. But we were ranked in the top ten, top five just about the whole year as well. We had a really good year, and we talked about the players. And when the, the regional host sites came out, uh, there was eight of them, and we were shocked that we weren't one. But they used to send one up in the northeast, up in uh, uh, Connecticut, and we thought we would be that that team that would go up there, be the number one seed in this neutral site up in Connecticut. And then it came out; they sent us. We were the two seed uh, to go to College Station. We won the first game, lost the second game, had to come out of losers bracket. Uh, you say two, you had to beat them twice, but we had to win two on Saturday just to get to Sunday to beat a and twice. And so once we got to the Sunday, we knew we had a good shot because we had Ben McDonald to start the first game, and, of course, he won. Uh, but the, the second game, I think, went 13 innings. Pat Garrity, you know, in the top of the 13th, hits a double off the wall to score, uh, score I think, Craig Calla. Uh, ben McDonald comes in to relieve Curtis Laskanik in the bottom of the 13th with with two outs to get the final From out. right field, right? Uh, no, that was in the first, first game. First game, okay. He, he was in the bullpen. Uh 
and came out and got the the, the final out and we we got it. and that that was kind of a I think a you know a, a a huge moment you know for LSU baseball just because of beating A and M yeah uh, and uh, number one slaying team the on, giant and, and and doing it on the road you know, getting to the World Series on the road and a year after we didn't make it back to the World Series. So uh, it was a special moment. So you didn't start out as a coach? No, I did not. See, I know things about you. Yeah. See, yeah. You're pretty good. I've, You've done I've, your research. Oh, I've been there. I remember when you came back into into coaching. Yeah. But you, what brought you back into coaching? You know, I was the first person in my family to graduate on either side. And, uh, you know, like a lot of young kids, my parents say, hey, you're going to go to college, you're going to get a degree, you get a degree, you get a better job, get a better job, you make more money. And so I grew up in a middle class family. And the truth is, I got everything I needed and just about probably everything I wanted. And so as a young person, you say, neither one of my parents have a college degree. And I'm going to, if I get this degree, this, this, whatever that is, you know, this piece of paper, I'm going to have more than this. Man, I'm going to be a gazillionaire, right? And, uh, and I used to watch how hard the assistant coaches worked you know smoke laval and mm-hmm. the ga's jim wells and rooster south hall and randy davis and i was like some of those lived in the same apartment complex as i had lived in as a student and they were 35 years old married some of them had kids and i was like i didn't come to college and 20 years later to be working my tail off and be just like these guys and so i went back home and was a financial planner uh, for a couple months and realized quickly uh, that uh, wasn't going to be a huge success in the financial planning industry. So I remember calling Coach Bertman back up and I said, you told me I should have been a coach. I didn't listen to you then, but what do I need to do now? And he said, well, Jim Wells needs a graduate assistant up at Northwestern State. That's where you need to go. And so uh, after, you know, failed in business after maybe six months after graduating, I went to Northwestern State uh, and where Wells was just taking over the program at Northwestern State. So I want to ask you a question. I'm going to tell you a story first, and right. then we'll wrap it up and let you get back to leading men. Um, you never know when a coach impacts you. I'm going to tell you a story how you impacted me. Oh, wow. Um, and you don't know this story, but I want to share it with you because I've held on to it for 20-something years. So when you came back in 93, and I had an amazing fall. And I don't, you don't remember it, but I, for me it was amazing. Mm-hmm. And you got me in shape, and it was great mm-hmm. running. And then I struggled, but then I found something. And I was going to quit going into my fourth year. Todd was going to be my roommate, was going to be the you know, top pick in the draft. Right. And I was going to go to law school and all this other stuff. And, and I would listen to you guys and talk because I, I couldn't beat people physically, but I could try to win mentally mm-hmm. and take what I have. And, and go into my senior year, and I'm engaged at that point now to Missy, my wife. And I walk up to you, and it's about leading into the, the first week of the season. We're doing a night practice. Mm-hmm. I walk over to you, and I'm on the batting cage. And, and at this point now, I'd had a successful 94 season. It was smoke and mirrors, but mm-hmm. I got it done. Mm-hmm. And I'm walking over there, and I'm like, hey, Mike, listen, I got to go to bio. I got to go to marriage encounter. And you said, oh, yeah, because mm-hmm. Catholic. Yeah. And, and you said, oh, yeah. And, and we start talking, and you said, you know, I don't know if you remember this. You might not, and you can say you don't. But he said, I know – when I knew Cammy was right for me. And we were just talking. It was mm-hmm. like, it was one of those moments, like as a fifth year senior, you're having this contemporary right. conversation. Yeah. We're not talking about where's the seeds and who's raking the field. It's right. like adult conversation, right. right? And we're talking and you said, you know, Garth Brooks' song, Unanswered Prayers. Yeah. And I, I, it became like a motto for you mm-hmm. because of all the unanswered prayers you had. And you realized one day when you looked across at Cammie and you realized what you had. Mm-hmm. And I knew what I had with Missy, but that was a moment for me that that was in a very adult conversation to have as a player to a coach, right. a coach to a player. And I thank you for that. Well, I sincerely thank you because I could talk about how you got me in shape and how you had to make me go run those damn five and a half mile runs and I hated doing everything or you know you in the bullpen and I wish I had you in the bullpen my last two years but because you moved to a different role but you get my point but sure but that was a that was an awesome conversation and I don't think as coaches you guys realize sometimes those little ones and how they stick with a guy I mean here we are 24 years later and I can remember the smell of the field that day wow well well, thank you, thank you for yeah. sharing that. And you are correct. I'm, all, you know, you're embarrassed as a coach sometimes because you don't remember some of those conversations. Right. But I know those happen, and uh, and obviously it touched you. And and so when you start to say some of those things, I remember. I remember when that song came out, and yeah. my wife and I had talked about you know much about you know you know that song and how you know you know how that really 
it fit our relationship and me in general. And, and, um, but I think what you're saying to the point, uh, not just for Brett McCabe or Mike Bianco in those moments, it happens all the time in coaching. That's why it's such a rewarding profession because there's moments where, you know, we talk about we're impacting young people. We are. And, you know, a lot of times I think as coaches, we think it's all about the base hits or the batting average or the ERA, some of the impacts and maybe the most important ones are the other ones, making a kid do some community service, you know, a kid trying to get, find his way through school that's struggling and you, you get him through and he graduates and, and you know, that's, that's part of my job. My part right. of my job is to get him to go to class and, you know, get, you know keep him, you know, to, to be good citizens, but you're doing that. And, you know, as a parent, if you do it to your two kids or your three kids, you know, you're successful parents. We got 35, 40 kids, you know, every, you know, besides our kids at home, we got 35, 40 kids that we got them at such an age at 18 to 22 years old that we can be very impactful. And you hope, you hope that at the end of 20 years or 30 years or 40 years or how long you coach, there's moments like that for, for everybody. And, uh, and you don't know. Like you know, yeah. 24, late, 24 years later, I, I remember that. But I've heard, you know, you go to different alumni things, and everybody's great. They, they tell funny stories. But it's amazing what kids remember. And I call them kids. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Young, yeah. young adults. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's amazing. You know, sometimes you don't realize at that moment that you're having those impactful, you know, conversations or, or something that you got. You know, if it's, you know, the, the warm fuzzy, the confidence uh, that you gave somebody one day to succeed, you know, uh, to – to, to choose a career or whatever it is. And I think that's what makes our profession so, so neat. Yeah. Let's get you to win the big one. Let's do it. Yeah, that's what you want. So yeah. thank you for doing this. Thank you for the impact you've had in my life. I know you've made a great impact on Brett Basham's life. Um, although, you know, we, we still pick <laughs> on him so much. But um, thank you for everything and, and, and continued success. Thanks, Brett. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you very much.